So we are now going to skip ahead from the ancient Greeks, skip over the entire Middle Ages and concern ourselves with um, philosophical notions that arose at the start of what we now consider modern science. We're going back to the early 17th century, that is from 1600 to 1650, which is when René Descartes lived. We need to understand the context in which this was. This is just after the Galilean Copernican Revolution, in which a mechanistic view of the world was replacing a much older cosmology. Um, the religious concerns and scientific concerns have not separated yet, and what we'll see is Descartes is trying in some respects to um, provide a, an, a free ray, a free playing field for emerging natural science um, without relying on uh, theological concepts. Theology is never far away, though. So Descartes here, with his fantastic hair, we will think of him as being the principal proponent of the rationalist tradition. Rationalism is concerned with the use of reason and with securing knowledge as certainly, as, as definitively as is possible. And Descartes' method starts with a form of skepticism, which he doesn't take very seriously, to be honest. The skepticism is to um, acknowledge that the senses can be misleading. You can be misled by what you saw or think you see, by what you hear, by what you feel. Um, Descartes knew all about hallucinations, dreams, fantasies, um, and so on. And for him, reason was distinct from the evidence of the senses. Reason um, was a purely intellectual abstract activity belonging to the mind. And Descartes is going to be one of the first, and probably the most important, person as a notion of mind becomes articulated. Um, for Descartes, the further the mind is taken away from its proper objects, which he sees as logic and reason, the more likely it is to fall into error. And so he had a rather unique view of philosophy, which was to get rid of the untrustworthy stuff, get rid of the confusing images of the senses, and to advance through philosophical thinking towards what he called the indubitable truths contained within the mind itself. So in his famous meditations, he lays out at length this skeptical approach. Um, a skeptical philosopher wanting to establish a foundation for true and certain knowledge recognizes that the world of appearances as mediated by the senses may be illusory. And he comes up with a fantastic notion of an evil demon who's trying to trick him by um, giving him hallucinations and false visions and such like. And he says, OK, if I recognize that all that is somehow insecure, that knowledge is not on a certain foundation, he considers what remains if you deny the testimony of the senses. And in the second meditation, he does this move, which continues to resonate very, very strongly today, 350 years later. So after considering everything very thoroughly, I must finally conclude that this proposition, I am, I exist is necessarily true whenever it is put forward by me or conceived in my mind. In other words, he's saying, no matter how wrong I am, it is clear that there is an I who is wrong. And in this lies his conviction um, that he, I am, I exist, cannot be denied. Now, this is not a straightforward argument. Uh, it lands us in all kinds of trouble. Um, it produces the notion of an I as a mind separate from the world, something which became known as the cogito. Um, so the meditations written in French, the text was je suis, j'existe, 
but the Latin version, Cogito Ergo Sum, I think, therefore I am, is the more famous rendition of this. And the Cogito, as a distinguished mind, has never gone away. It underlies all our thinking about minds, and it's deeply problematic. Um, it is a notion we would probably prefer to do without, but we, can't, we, we have difficulty deconstructing this notion. The mind here is independent of everything else, hidden, private, and unobservable. So the cogito belongs in here as the abstract creation of something which will bridge from the Christian notion of a soul to the um, more modern but no less problematic notion of mind. Um, all these terms are as contested today as they ever have been. Um, but remember, the body is also contested. Most of our public arguments um, ultimately come down to disputes about what is proper to a body and the relationship between the body and the person. Um, so Descartes' metaphysics are a little bit odd. They're often described as one form of dualism. Now, dualism uh, in a metaphysical context can mean many things. It always means a partitioning of something into two. And here Descartes is assuming that that which is real is partitioned into two separate domains. The mental on the one hand, which he calls res cogitans, and the physical on the other, res extensa. Stuff that takes up space is for him what, that which is physical. So we might think of that as material. And abstract ideas... Um, belong to res cogitans. In fact, the notion that ideas are something you can have in your mind comes from Descartes. So much of our everyday language begins right here. Now, if you have two separate domains of reality, here's mental stuff and here's physical stuff, there's a problem. They have to interact somehow. Now, the physical stuff at this early day of the, this early stage of science is becoming clearer and the general account is one of mechanical motion in which um, determinism underlies all change. Things move around, collide, forces are exchanged, motion proceeds mechanically like machines. But the mental and therewith the problematic notion of free will, individual freedom, and so on, is needs to interact with this physical stuff because otherwise we don't have an account for how I can decide to pick up a pen. I just decided to pick up the pen, and lo and behold, my hand moved and the pen gets picked up. The pen is material. This is a material pen. And yet somehow, res cogitans, the mental, is involved because I decided, I willed, so Descartes never solved this problem, nor has anybody else, nor is there a solution. This is just a bad starting point, but it's the one we're stuck with because it has determined our thinking ever since. Um, Descartes helped himself to the pineal gland, which is a small gland that dangles at the base of the brain in the middle of the head. Roughly, if you sort of <laughs> ask where those three axes intersect, that's where the pineal gland is. Descartes wasn't too well up on anatomy. He, wasn't, he himself wasn't even sure where the pineal gland is. And he suggested this might be the magic organ of the body at which the mental and the physical interacted. It's a lousy solution. It never had any plausibility whatsoever. Nobody's ever pursued it. People have tried various ways to get this kind of substance dualism um, to work. Substance dualism, because there are two kinds of substances, an old medieval notion, substance, the mental substance and physical substance. So don't think of substance as matter, because only the physical substance is matter. Substance is a much richer concept than, than matter. So we got these two kinds of substance, and they have to interact somehow causally, but all the scientific causal explanations are in the mechanical realm. So how do you do it? Well, here's three possible solutions. None of them work. Um, an interactionist dualist solution would have physical events causing mental events and mental events causing physical events, which sort of interrupts the flow of things and requires a locus at which the mental can interact with the physical. This is more or less what Descartes was thinking of when he suggested, oh, maybe the pineal gland. 
But there are other ways to think about a sequence of mental events going along in parallel with a sequence of physical events. And the mental events have their own causal structure and the physical events have their own causal structure. A very pessimistic way of looking at this is mere epiphenomenalism. So there is a sequence of mental events and they correspond with and even are explanatory for a sequence of physical events. But actually, causation lies in the physical realm and the mental events are just um, what we call epiphenomena. Yes, they occur, but they have no causal effect whatsoever. In this particularly pessimistic view, you are actually a, a, a mere witness to the unfolding of a predetermined universe. This fitted some religious pictures like Calvinism, for example, and predeterminism. It makes you a, 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 um, a spectator to your own life, incapable of actually achieving anything. So it's not a very useful solution. Then there's psychophysical parallelism. So we've got mental events going along, wills, intentions, desires, perceptions, everything that you think of as being in the mind. And we've got physical events going along and they magically work out so that my intention comes just before my picking up the pen. Um, but actually there's no interaction between the two and they're all held in place by something larger, which makes sure, something outside of these two substances, which makes sure that they all tick along together. That thing that is outside of everything is of course, nothing other than God. Um, so this isn't going to work in a scientific context either. I think this is probably the solution favoured by Leibniz, but it's not one we're going to be taking seriously. So none of these work. <laughs> um, for Descartes, the body is itself a machine, and indeed all animals are nothing but machines. They are automata. They have no souls. So theology is never far away. Um, this assumes that humans are fundamentally different from animals, and we can see that this particular move in the philosophy of mind was made at a time in which uh, the relationships between politics, religion, knowledge were very differently distributed than they are today. Um, Descartes happens in history before Newton. After Newton, we have switched into scientific modernity, as it were. Newton provided the a definitive account of mechanics through his famous three laws of motion. He provided the, the very idea of a natural law which could describe the unfolding of events in the world. And this was a foundation stone in the establishment of modern, uh, the modern scientific perspective. Um, and we make still make use of very Newtonian concepts. We appeal to mechanisms all the time, often unthinkingly without asking what is a mechanism. Um, people often wrongly think that science's job is to describe mechanisms. Mechanics has its limits, and let's look at them. The entire mechanical framework of Newton is no longer our best physics. It's been superseded replaced. But it's still the best physics for accounting for the motion of inanimate, rigid matter at spatial and time scales appropriate to the human body. You remember the, the old wives tale about an apple falling on Newton's head. An apple is a nice tangible thing. It's reasonably solid. Uh, it falls in a very specific way. That kind of motion is well accounted for, well described under certain idealized conditions within a mechanical framework. What a mechanical framework doesn't provide is any account of animate motion, of the movements of the living, the activities of the living, behavior, um, even lifting my hand is not accounted for in this, this framework. And nor, unfortunately, does a purely mechanical framework give any room for the mind or the soul. So when we appeal to mechanics, we are um, limiting ourselves to a very, very small set of tools. The cogito places the mind outside of the material realm. And this leads to all kinds of problems, but problems that we haven't got away from, problems that we still have when we describe ourselves as if we were independent of, of our context. It leads to the bizarre notion, which nobody wants to advocate for, of solipsism.
Solipsism is this strange idea that, the, imagine if you will, uh, that you're the only person with a mind in the world. Well, look around you, you can see other people have bodies, but you can't see their minds. And yet you're in no doubt, for reasons that Descartes outlined, that you are, you exist. The light of consciousness is on inside you, if you like. So you have direct knowledge of your own mind and only circumstantial evidence of everyone else's. Maybe they're all robots. I don't think they are. So nobody really wants to defend this position, but you can try it on for size. It's a funny philosophical paradox you can try. So we've now reached the problem. The agent of mind is now outside of nature, as it were. And the world has been deanimated. The world is understood to um, be animated by purely mechanical forces. Um, and yet that was the single most significant event in the philosophy of mind. Descartes conjuring up, it must be said, of the cogito from the Christian notion of the soul. It persists today. It persists in the belief that there is a psychological subject. It persists in all your beliefs about yourself. Um, and we will be confronting many of the problems that arise as we go on.